I've had uh, several to ask me uh, some things with regard to the promise keepers. For those who do not know, Promise Keepers is a movement that uh, was born uh, by one of the uh, coaches, I think is head coach of, um, of uh, Colorado State uh, football team there. I can't call his name at the moment. He's a Christian man, and uh, I believe that he retired from coaching and uh, saw the need for uh, an organization that uh, he calls Promise Keepers, and it deals with men. And it deals with men keeping uh, their promise uh, regarding or with respect to their marriage. And uh, this thing has grown from several hundred in a a stadium there to almost 700,000 annually meeting together, reaching into the millions of those who want to go but simply either cannot afford it, cannot get off work during that time, uh, or what have you. It has snowballed as a so-called Christian movement. Now, uh, again, you would think that um, someone who uh, is in the ministry or any Christian would say, well, anything that would be involved in strengthening family ties should be something that is praised uh, of believers as, as that which is ordained of God and, uh, and is going to bring glory to Him and a strengthening of family ties. However, uh, we disagree. We don't believe that there is a whole lot good with promise keepers except their intentions. Now, we have find no fault with intentions. Uh, Any time that uh, the family relationship or marriage relationship can be strengthened, uh, the bond uh, increased, uh, that is good. However, Promise Keepers opens its doors to any and all religions. And it's therein that we find fault. Because they may teach men to keep their promises to their, to their wife and family. But they, in turn, are teaching men to break their fidelity to God. And I always ask the question, which is more important? Ask yourself the question. Is it more important for you to be faithful to God than any human contract or relationship? Now, of course, we will go back to Adam and Eve. Uh, Eve broke her contract to God, broke her contract with Adam uh, to love, honor, and obey. Uh, She said, I'm not going to obey Adam. I'm going to do my own thing. And she did. And uh, so therefore, she took of the fruit and she started the first um, ecumenical movement with the first female pastor of the first liberal church, which changed and corrupted the word of God. Now, that's where the ecumenical movement is. Now, Adam had a problem, and it's something we're going to deal with with regard to the promise keepers and why there is even a, a phenomenon known as the promise keepers. His problem became an identity problem. Is he a man that's going to stand up and rule his house and tell Eve, you've done wrong and you're going to suffer the consequences? Or is he going to be El Wimpo and say, Yes, my love, I'll eat the fruit with you, and you and I will be sinners. Who cares? We've got each other. Who cares about God? And again, that's the philosophy of evil. Strengthening marriage ties and leaving God out is an evil marriage. I don't care if it's legal. I don't care if it's moral. It is an evil marriage. God brought the first man and the first woman together. And if God is not in that marriage, it is not blessed of God. It is not ordained of God. It is not sanctioned of God, except as an institute for believer and unbeliever alike. Now, that's where the promise keepers fails. It uh, talks about marriage, but it in turn, it sanctions infidelity to the very God who ordained marriage in the first place. And uh, besides that, um, and we're not going to get into a whole lot of that right at this time. We'll reserve that for a time when uh, I get into the communion wine and it bolsters my courage just a little bit more. Uh, And uh, 
uh, we'll talk about the fact that, um, did you know that there are no marriage vows in the Bible? There, you, you can't find the one. Now somebody will say, whether thou goest, I will go. Thy people will be my people. Thy God, my God. Pastor, that's in the Bible. Yes, and it was said of a mother-in-law, <laughs> I mean, of daughter-in-law to a mother-in-law, not of a wife to a husband. Now, the implication is there, of course, but, uh, but there are no marriage vows in the Bible. There are marriage contracts. How long did Jacob work for Leah? Seven years. Wonder how long most husbands will work for wives today. Well, it should be seven years. But for, for those really worthy, uh, Rachel, how many years? 14 years. See, he thought he was going to get Rachel to begin with. Jacob worked 14 years for this guy. But what is that? Do we work to purchase women today for marriage? Uh-uh. Eliezer, the servant of, of Abraham, went up and um, looked for Rebekah for Isaac. But what did he do? He put his hand underneath Abraham's thigh. Strange thing, looking for a wife. Abraham didn't even send Isaac to look for his own wife. He sent his best servant, his most trusted servant, Eliezer. He put his hand under the thigh, which meant he is bound with his life if he doesn't do what Abraham says. And Abraham says, I want you to go back to my country and take a whole lot of money with you and uh, camels and goats and, and you know uh, all of the animals we have. And I want you to swap all this wealth and bring back a wife for, for my son, uh, Isaac. Now, that's how people got wives in those days. And uh, there, there was no such thing as a promise made. It's, you are my property. I own you. And uh, it even goes back to the days of, of Adam and, and, uh, and Eve, where you're flesh of my flesh, bone of my bones, you'll be called, called woman because you're taken out uh, of the man. So that's where promise keepers misunderstand. They do not understand marriage to begin with, let alone Christian marriage, let alone spiritual marriage, and they are dispensationally incorrect. Why are they going after the families? Why does Roman Catholicism go after families and strengthening marriage bonds? It's interesting that uh, they have people there who are unmarried, who have never been married, who are counseling others to both raise kids and be faithful to one another and have good marriages. And they have never gotten in the trenches of a home and, and uh, living one with the other. And they're teaching other people. And it's the most powerful religious organization in the world. Who is it? Roman Catholicism. But why do they want marriages strengthened? It's because they pray every Sunday or Saturday night if you don't want to come to Sunday Mass. Uh, thy kingdom come. They're trying to bring in the kingdom. And in order to bring in universal, uh, the universal kingdom of prosperity and bliss and the rest, what do you have to have? You have to have good homes. You have to have husband, wife, and kids as good Catholics to bring in the kingdom. That's why there is an emphasis on marriage with them. And, uh, but the problem is they're dispensationally wrong. Uh, and it's not that uh, in the dispensation of grace there should not be good marriages and the like. But the reason they want good marriages is because they want a, the kingdom to come. They want to spruce up the world, everybody to get along and the like. It's just like uh, 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 today. Um, uh, what a tragedy that uh, Rabin has been shot. But do you know why Rabin has been shot? Rabin, as a Jew, signed a piece of paper that says, I'm going to give the West Bank to the Palestinians. Cursed is he that curses you. That land belongs to the Jews, Rabin should have said, and to the, to the death, to the last Jew, if it takes that, we're going to keep that land as it's given to us in the Abrahamic covenant. And when he signed that piece of paper, he signed his life away, and God says, that's fine, sin unto death, and bang, into eternity he goes without Christ. Now, it's a sad thing, but, but I'm telling you, the, these things are taught in the scriptures, and, and the ecumenical movement is the most powerful force leading to the harlot church. The harlot church is already on the rise. The harlot church, in starting in the Vatican Council, October 11th of 1962, began the ecumenical movement with, with full speed ahead. 
I mean, uh, the little old lady from Pasadena has put the pedal to the metal and they are pushing toward a one world religion and it's called the Catholic Church. But they have to bring everybody under the umbrella. That's called the ecumenical movement. Now, because of this, it has also, and I'm gonna use a little cute little phrase here because we're gonna talk about the winds and the waves on the ocean, that has rocked the boat of fundamentalist evangelical Christianity. We now have to do things to attract people. That is the big thing. I, I just uh, uh, got a call from a, a friend of mine in a church down south. It's a Grace Church uh, of about oh, 170 people down there. And, uh, and uh, the, the uh, pastor that they're getting it's a, is a liberal guy in, from the GGF. And most of the church said, we want a conservative pastor who teaches the Bible. We do not want somebody up there who is le leading us in trendy Christianity. Now, what I mean by trendy Christianity is they look at television, they look at the trends of history and the movements of history and say, well, you know what? We have to be like the world. We have to do what the world is doing to attract people. And one of the men on their board actually said this, we have to move away from a strong Bible teaching ministry if we're ever going to attract people. And this guy's on the quote pulpit committee. We want to move away from a strong Bible teaching ministry if we're ever going to attract people. Now, do you know uh, that that man is a museer? Do you know that that man has absolutely no spirituality whatsoever? The answer is not to try to compromise or water down a message to attract people. The answer is teach the truth and let the chips fall where they may. That's the answer. Jesus Christ didn't water, oh, they're there. We'll change the truth uh, to make you fit and, quote, feel better in our little group. He did not. He told the Pharisees, you're a bunch of snakes, and if you do not believe it, you're going to go to hell, and you deserve to go there. You're a generation of vipers, and the judgment of God's too good for you. You deserve to go there. Now, it, in, instead of just simply telling the truth and letting people adjust to it volitionally, we now have to water it down. And it's what um, a, a Time magazine, I believe it was the, the magazine, said that the baby boomer generation is redefining church. And I always ask the question, didn't God define it in his word? Why do we need to redefine what God has already established permanently in his, in his word? And so now we have worship services. Uh, we have a grace church that, uh, that has split from, uh, from a Berean Bible church, and we now have it called the Celebration Church. Took with it all the young people so that they could have their, their praise services. Now, there's nothing wrong with praising God. Don't misunderstand. But that's what they do every service. The pastor gives a little ditty after everybody does their thing. They have their praise leaders and, and, and so forth. And the pastor gets about 20 minutes if he's, quote, lucky. And then everybody goes home and, oh, it was just good to have been here. You see, they have long ago done away with Sunday night and Wednesday night. So all you need is one praise service. Uh, get, get plugged in, get your batteries recharged, and go out and live for the Lord the rest of the week. And I want to say wrong. You cannot live the Christian life in darkness or ignorance. You must know the mechanics and dynamics. That means you must learn how to sustain the filling of the Holy Spirit with the recalling of Bible doctrine to life. And unless you, re unless you cover the material, unless you put it in its setting, unless you see how it applies to you in your circumstances, you will never live the Christian way of life. It's impossible. And uh, if you can show me a different, I'll gladly say, okay, fine, I was wrong. But I'm not wrong. That is the objective of the Christian way of life. But it's uh, lent itself to trendy Christianity of doing things like the Willow Creek experience. That's not a blasphemous mess. 22,000 people. And you know what? 
Here's what he says. I only market my ministry to those who drive BMWs. You know, if you don't have a certain income bracket, we don't want you here in our church. You know, and you can come, instead of getting dressed up and showing respect for God's house, come any way you want. Come in a barrel for all I just don't get arrested. You know, come in a barrel for all I care. And what, here's what we'll do. There'll be this praise stuff, and uh, then we'll put on a little drama for you, and I'll get up and give whatever they call it, the gospel, and you can go home, and that's all you need. And I'm telling you it's wrong. It is wrong. But he has 22,000 people. Surely he's doing something, right? Hey, the, Lucifer has the world. Much, much, <laughs> and, and is he doing something right? Does Lucifer have the numbers? Yeah. Does he have the media? Yeah. Does he have all of the resources and potential? Yes, he does. As far as the world is concerned, the only thing we have that's different and better and broader in scope is God's resources. And, uh, and um, the greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. God will always prevail. But it's lent itself to trendy Christianity. Uh, and... Uh, in doing things, uh, uh, following certain ones and certain trends, as I said, the, the, the praise and the worship services, rather than Bible study. And it is a trend away from the local church. It is a trend to hurt the local church. Do you suppose all those thousands of men that went to Promise Keepers came back home and have been faithful to their pastor teacher and the study of the word of God. Do you suppose they have? Where are they? Where are all the men who went from the grace circles? You see, I know better. I've been in this business and around grace circles for a long time. I know exactly what they do. They'll go and get, get all hyped up and emotional in a promise keepers meeting because somebody will make them cry. Uh, telling a sob story. And, uh, and they'll go back home, and you know how long it'll last? Until after they give their testimony about how good Promise Keepers was. Now, uh, before I move on, just let me say, there is nothing wrong with a man giving a testimony for Jesus Christ. There is nothing wrong with men getting together and praying and studying God's Word. Uh, we have a thing called Grace Men here, um, our schedule, the last time they had it, uh, uh, did not lend itself for us to, to go. We had things going here. But, uh, but there's nothing wrong with grace men getting together. Men of like faith. You see, that's what, our, that's what the Bible says. It is like-minded. To be part of the ecumenical movement, you can't be like-minded. And you say to me, Pastor, wait a minute. That like-minded business, and, and here we, as was one of the things that I found fault with with our conference. There were a couple there who said, um, our strength is in our diversity. We don't have to think alike, and, and it's, it was very difficult. Steam started going from my ears, but I shut off the valve because it was beginning to well up in me. Uh, we cannot be like-minded. Then why does the Bible say that we are to be like-minded, striving together in one mind for the faith of the gospel? You say, well, pastor, we're all individuals. We're all diverse. We have male and female, different backgrounds, different ages. We can't be like-minded. And I want to say to you, I'm going to prove to you that you can be like-minded. Just turn on channel 23 and look at the country music show called Club Dance. There are people there who are younger and smaller and people there who are older and taller all dancing, we'll just call it. I don't know what the dances are called, but I heard one, the boot scootin' boogie, okay? And they will line up, sometimes 15 lines. And do you know something? Every single one of those people's like-minded. Because of the song calls for sticking your right hand out, and it just seems as though there it's a herd mentality. They'll all put their right hand up. They'll all put their left hand. They'll all back up three steps. They'll all go forward three steps. They'll all go left three steps. At the same time, now do you suppose if everybody did their own thing, they would be able to do the boot scooting boogie like that? You have to be like-minded. Now, my question is, if somebody, if that group of people can all learn a dance and do it together, 
uh, and you don't even find one who's out of step. I mean, that, that kick, <laughs> he, 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 he knocks down some, you know, little old lady over here because he's out of step. They're going to get mad and say, you sit out till you do what? Learn the, da the dance. You either learn the dance or you don't get, you get in with the group, okay? Now, uh, we can be like-minded. And it's idiocy to think differently. Yes, we're all different, but the thing is, in order for us to understand Christianity, in our diversity, we must all think the same thing. That is the answer to Lucifer. We're all different, but we all think alike. Now, someone's going to say, is that possible? And I'm going to say, how did you get saved? Well, I believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you know something? If I was going to get saved, do you know how I, I would get saved? By doing the same thing. I did the same thing at age 19. I believed on him. Do you get saved otherwise? The answer is no, you do not. There is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be what? Saved. If you don't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you are not saved. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. And if you do not think the same way, you're not saved. Just sit down. You, God doesn't invite you to the dance. And, and you, can, you, you can kick up your heels all you want, but you're not going to be on the floor until you learn the program and think just like everybody else who is saved. And, that's, and that is my point. Trendy Christianity says we don't have to think alike. We can accept anyone and everyone who teaches differently than a by grace through faith salvation. And I'm telling you that is a lie, that is a wrong from the pit of hell, and it is supporting, it is lending your aid to help the harlot church rise and have power. That's called trendy uh, Christianity. Uh, another thing, uh, there are certain authors who get trendy, and I'm going to name a name. And somebody's going to say, oh, pastor, name a name. Uh, some guy that took over after Chuck Swindoll is named Max Lucado. Now, isn't everybody reading Max Lucado? Yes, but I'm not. I don't care, I don't care to have, have the man's books in my library. But pastor, it just seems like he is writing books. Yeah, he's, he's writing books faster than I can breathe. Uh, I don't understand how the man can write so many books. We say, pastor, what's wrong with him? Well, he's a church of Christ preacher. Well, he's writing Christian books. He's real sincere. Well, let, let's ask Church of Christ or Christian churches. How do you get saved? Well, you meet the blood of Christ when you meet the waters of baptism. Be dipped and be damned. And then if you sin bad afterwards, you can lose your salvation. Now, mind you, you remember, somebody take issue with me. I don't make these statements unless I check it out. And I know flat well what they believe. And I know flat well there are people in big churches in this town who believe that. And, uh, and are around others who say, well, Max Lucado is great. How can you buy a man's books who teaches a different way of salvation? How can you give him your money and support? to write another book to suck people in to the false doctrine of the Christian church. It's like a lady said, uh, the Christian church had a visitation program, knocked on the door and came in and she was a Baptist. And uh, she got all upset and she said, I've been a Baptist all my life and nobody's going to make a Christian out of me. You're not welcome to be here. So anyway, that's is a... The Christian church doesn't, doesn't teach the truth about salvation. Their salvation is in ritual and in works, not grace through faith. And Max Lucado is an apostate and a heretic. Now, I'm, I'm not saying that because I want to personally attack somebody. I'm saying it because they get into Christian circles and, and people push this nonsense. If he's so good, why don't we just shut the doors here and go to the big Christian church here in town and push them and support them and give them our money and invite others to do that? Why don't you do it? It's because their doctrine is wrong. 
People go to hell by believing false doctrine, and Max Lucado teaches false doctrine. Now, why do we say that? Simply because promise keepers like the ecumenical movement is an attack upon grace pastors and grace churches. Note, here's the program for the dispensation of grace. Chapter 4, verse 11. He gave some grace evangelists, last part of the verse. These put people into the body of Christ by teaching grace through faith salvation. And some, Granville Sharp's rule, it's two sides of one gift, pastor teachers, to do what? Here's the program for the, for the age of grace. A promise keeper's movement? No. The local church. That is the program. That is where men come to learn spirituality. That is where men come to learn Bible doctrine. And if men get together as a group, they get together per se with others of like mind to share and fellowship together. Otherwise, it is nothing more than an ecumenical movement intended to be little doctrine and, and, to, and to get together with some nebulous thing called love. We'll cover that in just a little bit. So what is the pastor to do? The pastor teacher perfects the saints for the work of the ministry, the edifying of the body of Christ. That, verse 14, we should henceforth be no more children. You see, what, what is the problem today? Men today are not growing up. Men today are not growing up especially in Christ. No more children spiritually. There's a responsibility that men have that is placed on their shoulders that's not given to women or children. It's given to men. Uh, that reminds me, I saw a little ditty on the uh, sinking of the Titanic there, and a uh, guy that was, uh, was uh, just married, and uh, they were saying women and children first, getting in the lifeboat. And uh, the wife said, uh, come on, we're married. They're going to make an exception to the rule. And the captain got his megaphone out and came down there to that situation and said, women and children first, women and children first. In other words, that's, that's the law of the sea. It doesn't marry, it matter about marriage. That's, that's the law. That's the way it's going to be. And so he had to uh, bypass the lifeboat in order to, uh, in favor of a woman getting on the lifeboat. No more children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine. Now, tossed to and fro. That reminds me of a verse of Scripture with regard to the Gentiles. Holding your place here, come back to Isaiah. Chapter 57, verses 20 and 21. Why are the Gentiles tossed to and fro? Why then do they think they're arrogant enough to say, well, I'm only going to come to church if I can redefine it in my image? Do you know that's arrogant? You know, every single person that does that is arrogant. Instead of conforming to what God says, they make it up so that they'll feel more comfortable in church. Yeah, it's just what that guy said. Well, we're not going to attract everybody. People are not interested in Bible study. They're interested in all this other thing. Well, that's, that's true. But does that mean that you change the whole program just to cater to those, to get them? What do you have? The wicked, referring to the Gentiles, are like the troubled sea, the symbol for Gentiles, when it cannot rest, whose water cast up mire and dirt. Tossed to and fro, you're, you're like a child that cannot navigate in an open sea, in a boat, and the waves are, are tossing you up and down. There is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. The word wicked there simply means one who is evil. One who says, God, I don't want you in my life. And so God says, that's fine. The circumstances to bear just like Jonah and the whale. What caused them to toss them overboard? The winds and the waves that were about to sink the ship. Why did they do that? Jonah was wicked at that point. He didn't want to do the will of God. Over, over the uh, side he went. Okay, come back then to uh, uh, Ephesians 4. 
and carried about by every wind of doctrine. Now, this is an interesting thing. How were the holy men of old, how did they write doctrine? How did they write the Bible? Second Peter chapter 1. Verse number 20. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. Well, that's what it means to you. How often have we heard that? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Plus nothing, minus nothing. Well, that's what it means to you. But I believe be dipped or be damned. That's the thing. Uh, repent and be baptized for the remission of sin. Uh, so, well, that's what it means to you. How, how can you solve these problems with so many opposing viewpoints? Well, the way you solve it is by categorizing and dispensationalizing the Word of God, rightly dividing the Word to see what part fits for you. But note, for the Word of God, prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved, carried about, borne along. God the Holy Spirit moved them to write down the Word as an anchor to the soul. So he said, here are all the variables. I want you to write it down. And this is something sure and steadfast, immovable. You can park your boat there and the storms of life will come and it will not sink and not blow you away and will not uh, um, take you from the, the rock. Here is the word of God. They were moved to a point and they sat down there and that's it. God spake. But when you get off the rock, or aren't anywhere near the truth, the rock in the analogy, you are carried about with every wind of doctrine. You can never make it to a safe haven simply because the winds and the wave take you away from the shore, take you away from safety. And so, whether, whether it's one way or the other, here you are. And the wind blows this direction, and that's the direction you go. And that's the way Christians go today. Well, this is in vogue today, so we'll all do it because we don't want to be looked at as out of sync with everyone else. They, everybody else is doing that philosophy that was per, permeated the 60s has now had those same people to say, we're going to do that now to the church. And uh, then it blows this way, and you, you go with that crowd. You get on the bandwagon instead of doing one thing. What is that one thing? The thing that God has prescribed for all of us to do when he wrote down the Bible. We do not have to be trendy. We do not have to change our approach to appeal to the masses. What we have to do is be filled with the Spirit, accurately uh, represent the Word of God, tell the world the truth, and let them decide whether they want it or not changing everything else to try to appeal to them just simply to get a crowd is to compromise our message and to um, and to belittle the, the truth